Okay, well, let's get started. Today is uh, Thursday, and we'll be finishing up the last little bit of Chapter 3, uh, which covers that last little bit over transcription and translation. And by the time we finish this conversation, you'll understand why, again, we care, because we're moving into the idea of mutations and the effects that mutations can have on our overall anatomy and physiology. Then once we finish up this chapter three, we'll be moving into chapter four, which is histology. You've all seen histology, so it'll be a good overview. We'll add a few more details to what you've already had in lab. And we hopefully get through all that today. There might be a little bit of histology left for next uh, Tuesday, and the rest of uh, that lecture will be over chapter five, which is the skin. And that content, 3, 4, and 5, will be part of your next exam, along with uh, 17 through 36 on the vocab. I do want to make one change, or one announcement of a change. I just realized it yesterday, a student pointed out to me, that in your supplement, lecture supplement, you have all the objectives, right? And they're broken down by chapter, and the chapter numbers are incorrect. And so I changed the... Uh, first slide, you know, as we change books, I changed the first slide uh, of each presentation, but forgot to go back and change the numbers on the, on the objectives. So when you go back to the objectives, you're going to see chapter four, right? Chapter four is actually the second half of chapter three. So we're kind of going to be off by a page or two. So if you'll turn back to page 12, at the top of that, it says chapter four. Make that chapter three, part two, basically. Okay, chapter three, part two. And then the next page over on page 14, that says chapter five on the top. That should be chapter four from your Martini book. And likewise, the next one on the integumentary system should be chapter five. Don't mark, make any other marks at this point, but that'll at least get you correct for now. And I'll make a point of uh, making sure that is announced for each exam whatever chapter numbers need to be adjusted. So I apologize if that threw anybody off. But those objectives are kind of a nice study guide. If you'll look through those and just ask yourself, can I, can I answer all of those things, then you are in, certainly in good shape and you're preparing yourself well for the exam. This will be a full-length exam next Thursday, a week from today. You'll need your uh, Scantron form and a pencil, and that's all we'll do that day will be the exam. Uh, remember that exam will have... Um, those sentences as well, right, that I introduced last time. So don't forget to prepare for those and don't get sideswiped by those. Uh, that's something that you can prepare in advance and be very successful on. Well, let's continue with, uh, first of all, are there any questions? Anything at all to clarify? Lab, lecture, sequence of events? Okay, let's take a look. Uh, I should also say that I'm mastering. I believe the Chapter 4 homework became available to you yesterday or the day before. So you should now see Chapters 3 and 4 homework. Chapter 5 homework, I think, will appear tonight or tomorrow, so it'll be in a timely manner. Also, um, I put copies of the homework assignments on Mastering. You may have noticed that. That it's, there's chapters 3, 4, and 5 homework, or there will be, and then there's copy of chapters 3, 4, and 5. And that's simply an opportunity for you to repeat the homework if you choose to. Okay, so it's just another chance for you to run through the homework. Uh, if that's something you find helpful, it's there for you. It is not at all required. Make sure you do at least, you know, the first homework assignments for three, four, and five before the exam next week. The second, the copy one, is simply a choice if you choose to take it. It won't be graded. It won't be evaluated. Okay, just another tool for you to use. There's also that quiz that will be on there. Um, I'll mention it again next week, but it's going to come up. Um, I may look at that because we won't finish the material until Tuesday, right, in lecture. So I forget exactly when I have that deadline. I might move it to Wednesday if it isn't already. So I'll make a note of that. I may move that quiz a little bit later so that you know, we have a chance to at least talk about the material in lecture before you have to do the quiz. So I'll make that adjustment as well. Thinking out loud with you is good. Okay, let's turn to vocabulary. So picking up a 27. Uh, EF, we'll see uh, efferent, or you'll hear... Um, uh, efferent, we'll talk a lot about that when we get to the nervous system. It means something going away from. Ecto, we talked about the ectoderm briefly. That's the outer layer. Actually, we'll talk about that today. I take that back. We'll talk about the ectoderm today, the outer layer of something. Uh, ectomy, to cut out. So uh, appendectomy, to cut out the appendix. Edema or edema is referring to swelling. L, organelle, right? Something that's small. So the, it's a small organ, if you will, 
Just like our body is made up of organs, within the cell it's made up of organelles, small organ-like structures that have a specific function. M and N both refer to in or into. Embolism is, or embol means stopper. So an embolism is actually a blood clot that goes to the lungs that stops blood flow there. And so it's like stopper, stopping up the blood flow. Emesis, vomiting. Uh, so dysemesis would be painful vomiting, right? We talked about dys before. Uh, hematoemesis would be uh, vomiting of blood. Emia. Anything that ends in emia is a condition or an abnormal condition of the blood. So anemia would not be enough red blood cells. Um, hypoglycemia what would be a low level of sugar within the blood. Encephal, the brain. What was cephal? Cephal was head, right? And encephal, what's in the brain? Or sorry, what's in the head? The brain, right? So cephal is head, encephal is the brain. Encephalitis would be an inflammation of the brain. Endo within. So endocrine, you know, organs that secrete, right? Remember, credo means secrete. So uh, endocrine, things that secrete within the body. Endocardium, we'll see, is the lining within the heart, within the chambers of the heart. Entero, the intestines, enteritis would be an inflammation of the intestines. Epi, epidermis is on the dermis. Epicardium, a layer on the heart. Erythro, red, your erythrocytes are your red blood cells. Estha is sensation. So anesthesia is the lack of sensation. And EU, good. Uh, eupnea would be normal or good breathing. A eulogy would be a good word. We'll finish up with, uh, we'll do two more right now. X and exo, I like to exit on the outside. Exhale. Extra, also on the outside, think extracellular matrix, everything that's outside of the cell. Fasci, we'll see in the muscle and in the nerve that groups of structures run in bundles called fascicles. So fasci refers to a band or a bundle of tissue or structure. And then fibra, fever. If you're febrile, you are running a fever. Ferent. I mentioned before efferent or AF, right? We had toward and efferent away, or EF was away. Ferent is to carry. So afferent is to carry toward, efferent is to carry away. Fibro. Uh, we saw fibroblast cells that made fibers. These are protein fibers. Uh, fizz is a split or a slit. So you can make that either one, split or slit. A small little groove, right? Something that kind of has a slit or splits something in half. And then flux means flow. Uh, re means to do it again. So reflux is, you know, acid reflux to taste it all over again, right? Re, uh, flow. And we'll finish up there for today. And then keep in mind that we'll go through four more. We'll go through glyco and we'll go through those on next Tuesday. So let's go back and uh, take a look at this over idea of transcription and translation. I think I got about three slides further than this, but I'll start right here as a ramping up spot. And also, let me just ask, are there any questions uh, as you were looking over your materials related to tumors, cell cycle, uh, replication, the copying of DNA? Anything at all in the conversation that we shared together on Tuesday? Is it all making reasonable sense for you? So this overarching idea of the second half of chapter three is to figure out what is it? I mean, we know that DNA is this control molecule, the genetics of our cell, and we know that the DNA is important in, in regulating everything else in our body, making the proteins. We've mentioned briefly the organelles that are responsible for making the proteins, uh, the ribosomes, and the ribosomes are stuck on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We know about the nucleus, we know about the cytoplasm. Let's kind of make a story of this now in a, in a very general way and figure out what is going on. So this is picking up on page 115 of your course pack. So this idea of transcription, right? Transcription is a process. And in this process, 
the DNA, which serves as what we call the template or the, the original molecule, which you inherited from your parents, that molecule now is transcribed, a portion of it is transcribed into a messenger RNA molecule. This is relatively short, right? I mean, the DNA is 46 molecules, 46 chromosomes, together six feet long, and just a very, very small part of that would be transcribed. That transcribed region would be making an mRNA molecule, the messenger molecule. That messenger molecule is RNA. We talked about the difference in DNA and RNA briefly. It's a single-stranded molecule. And that molecule, what this figure does not show, is remember that that, that initial mRNA would be processed. Now, by processing, what does that mean? It means, remember that the initial molecule is composed of, um, I'll just use two different colors here. Remember that the original molecule is composed of both things that are called introns and exons, right? So this mRNA that's made right here would actually be a combination of introns and exons. And we'll say, we'll say that the I, right, the introns are the I part, or the red part. So the introns would be cut out, wouldn't they? And then the exon portions would be brought together and so that's really not showing on this slide. So we would re remind ourselves that in this process, you would first have transcription, and then number two would refer to the processing of that message to make the mature mRNA. That mature mRNA is now going to make its way out of the nucleus through the nuclear pores, out to the cytoplasm, where it will find ribosomes, either freely floating in the cytoplasm or attached to the rough ER. And here, the process of translation occurs. So now we take that message, which came originally from the DNA, and we now translate it with the help of the ribosome and this other molecule called a tRNA, and we now make proteins. Remember that proteins are long chains of amino acids. And so floating out here in the cytoplasm, there has to be a fair amount of amino acids available so that as the protein is being made, right, they are added into the protein that we see here at the bottom. So that's the overall idea. Remember that transcription must occur in the nucleus, whereas translation must occur in the cytoplasm. Has to be, has to be, right? That's where the organelles that are necessary occur, are, are, are housed. So we know that that must be the situation. Again, in this slide, uh, this one shows that idea of processing. So again, just as we review, what is number one? The process of transcription. Number two would represent processing, right? The idea that those introns are cut out, the exons are linked together, and then number three would be the process of translation. And again, we see these amino acids are floating out in the cytoplasm. The purple guy is the ribosome. The yellow is a single-stranded mRNA and the green chain is the newly made protein. Okay, so just again, going over this, translation is really the second half of this process <clears throat> where you're specifically making the protein from the mRNA sequence. It happens in the cytoplasm. That mRNA left the nucleus and had to go through those nuclear pores where it then binds to a ribosome. There, the transfer RNAs that I'll review with you in a moment will then bring the correct amino acid over to the ribosome and link together the amino acids to form the full protein. So if you're having any trouble with this, you can think about uh, what I mentioned last time, and that is transcription, right? A medical transcriptionist is one who just sort of copies, takes the verbal, and puts it onto paper. So transcription is making an exact copy. Now, it's a little bit of a, of a stretch there because it's not an exact copy, is it? Because DNA has in it Ts and RNA has in it Us. Other than that difference, though, it pretty much is a nice true copy of what the DNA shows. And then just like a secretary or a medical transcriptionist would do, they kind of clean it up. Right, so the, so the doctor, whomever, the business owner might kind of stumble over a couple of times saying what they're saying, 
and the transcriptionist is going to copy it and then kind of clean up the message and make it more sense. That's like the processing, right? We're going to clean it up, make the final product before we send it off. And then that final product would be then translated. So now you've got the final, quote, message, and you're going to have it translated by this translator called a ribosome into a different language. In this case, we're going from a language that only has four letters, A, C, G, and U, right, on the mRNA, to a language that is far more complex. It has 20 amino acids, right? There are 20 different combinations, 20 different letters, if you will, in the translated alphabet. So we've got a translation process here that has to occur, and the ribosome does that for us. Now, the ribosome does it with the help of these tRNA molecules. Okay, so the tRNAs are shown here. They look like lunar, lunar landing molecules, some sort of uh, some that's landing on the moon. And then there are all these amino acids also out in the cytoplasm. And the key to this is, if you ever did like a highlights for kids or some sort of translation where you had a code, right, and you had to translate it into some other code, you know that there's some key somewhere that helps you make that translation possible. And so the ribosomes along with the tRNA are going to, quote, decode the mRNA and figure out what the amino acid code or sequence should be. Each of these yellow, blue, green, and orange uh, structures on here represent what? Each of those little sticks there, green, orange, blue, and, and yellow, represents a base, right? A, C, G, or U, found on the single-stranded mRNA molecule. The tRNAs, what they're going to do is they're going to have groups of three nucleotides. Remember, a tRNA is an RNA molecule. It is itself made up of A, C, Gs, and Us. That's all it is. It's just a little molecule made up with A, C, Gs, and Us twisted in a weird way that looks like a little lunar module. Three of those nucleotides are going to specifically match up to three letters on the mRNA in the same sort of arrangement that we saw in replication. That is, Cs will bind with Gs, and As will bind with, in this case, U right, because there's no T's here, this is all RNA. So you would have A binding with U. And each three nucleotides along the mRNA is going to be the critical reading of this message. And then each of these three unique sequences, ACG, GGG, CCC, is going to be responsible for telling the ribosome which new amino acid to bring into this, to the new protein. So let's take a look at how this thing works. And this is just a picture to show you this whole process. But here comes the tRNA, right? And what the tRNA sees, there's these three nucleotides right here, right? Orange, yellow, blue, whatever that is. And the orange, yellow, blue is going to come down and specifically complement the three letters on the mRNA. The three letters on the mRNA are called the codon. So the, the three letters on the mRNA are the codon. The three nucleotides on the tRNA are called the anticodon. Okay, so the three letters on the tRNA are the anticodon. The three letters on the mRNA are the codon. And they're going to match up again C with G, A with, sorry, with U. And then the ribosome moves over and sees the next three letters on the mRNA. Another tRNA comes in, binds complementary-wise, and then brings in another amino acid. So let's make sense of this. So I've got a couple of examples using the same kind of uh, diagram. Big idea. You've got your DNA. We're in the nucleus, right? So the red is showing as the DNA. It's only showing one strand of the DNA. The other half is, is there, right? But it's just not shown. And we know it's DNA because it says it is, but we also see T's within the sequence. That DNA sequence will be transcribed in the nucleus to create this mRNA. This also doesn't show the processing. We know it's happening, though. So what we see is that the DNA had a G in it, so the mRNA has a C in it. Right? And the, the DNA had an A in it, so the mRNA has a U in it. 
now that mRNA is going to go to the ribosome and be translated in the nuclear, sorry, in the cytoplasm. And what we see is that each three letters is a codon. Now, also not shown in this picture is the tRNA that's going to come in and say, okay, every time I see CGU, right, every time the ribosome sees CGU, that codon, there is going to be a specific tr uh, tRNA that's going to bring in the amino acid called arginine, ARG. Every time the ribosome sees UCA, it is going to direct a tRNA to bring in an amino acid called serine. And there'll be a chart for this. It's like a fun little table chart to decipher this code. I'll share that code with you in a moment and how it's done, but let me, before I get there, just back up a little bit and talk to you again about proteins. So proteins are made up of amino acids, and there are 20 different amino acids, and basically those amino acids are going to get linked end-to-end -end in making a protein. And then that protein will kind of wind its way up into a unique shape. Remember we talked about how enzymes have a unique shape, different proteins have a unique shape, and that three-dimensional shape is important for the overall functioning of that protein. So every protein has a unique amino acid sequence. Every protein has a different, unique amino acid sequence. Well, where did that unique amino acid sequence come from? It was directed by the unique sequence of nucleotides in the DNA. Right, so the DNA is different, and that makes different proteins. Now, there's three different types of RNA that are going on in this story, and I just want to make sure that you're okay with these. Number one, number one, the one we've been talking about the most is mRNA. All right, so messenger RNA, we saw this. This is, quote, the message that is carried from the DNA out to the ribosome, and it's shown here as a single-stranded yellow molecule. Then there's, I've been mentioning the tRNA on the bottom, the transfer RNA, and this is the one that looks like this lunar landing molecule and has on its end the anti-codon sequence, and this is the one that's going to bring the correct amino acid into the ribosome. There's a third one, and I mentioned it a while back, and that is ribosomal RNA. Now, ribosomal RNA, I mentioned back when we talked about the nucleolus, the nucleolus. The rRNA, the ribosomal RNA, was made in the nucleolus, and it's a building block of the ribosome itself. Kind of makes sense, right? The ribosomal RNA helps to make the ribosome. This is a really interesting story because the ribosome itself is made of RNA. <laughs> well, and protein, right? So the ribosome is made up of RNA and protein. How does one make protein? It needs a ribosome. So it's kind of one of those chicken and egg kind of arguments that molecular biologists are still trying to figure out is how in the world, right, did the first cell ever figure its way out because you need one part to make the other part like the chicken and the egg kind of story. So it makes, it's a really interesting conversation. We don't have time to think about it, but it, you know, well, we have time to think about it. We just don't have time to discuss it. Okay. So we have the ribosomal RNA, and I apologize, there's a crisscross here in the pictures. So we've got three kinds of RNA. They're all RNA, right? They're all made up of A, C, Gs, and Us. Don't make it fancier or harder than it is. They just have different jobs. So again, I've already mentioned this idea that we're changing languages. If that helps you think about these processes, I know that they're just so similar, right? Transcription and translation. As I mentioned, the idea of copying something is transcription. The idea of changing the language is translation. Again, translation happens at the ribosomes in the cytoplasm, whereas transcription has to happen in the nucleus. So I told you that the, the whole basis of this thing is that the genetic code, the, the sequence contained in DNA, is in groups of three. And in fact, Watson and Crick, when they built their little model, they said, and they hypothesized in that paper, once they saw the structure of DNA and they thought about it, they said, you know what? It must be that the genetic code, how this whole thing works, must be on groups of three. Two wouldn't have been okay. Two wouldn't have been enough. And four would have been way too much. And so we don't have to go, don't worry about the math here. 
sorry. Don't worry about the math in here, but just know that um, two bases wouldn't have been enough. So they figured out, Watson and Crick said it can't be groups of two and it can't be groups of four because that would have been just too much. So the whole genetic code is based upon a triplet, a group of three bases. And we'll refer to this as the genetic code. Is that not also one of your final words, right? So I think that's now your 11th and final word from that list of terms. Now you'll hear the word genetic code used in two different ways. You'll hear it say that DNA contains our genetic code. That's true, right? The DNA does contain our genetic code. And you'll also hear the genetic code, that, that term used to describe this table. Because this table really is the deciphering table. Right? This is how the genetic code is deciphered. And over the years, this didn't happen magically, and it wasn't on the internet, right? This took years and years to develop. But what scientists figured out is that every time the, the, the mRNA has, for example, in it CUU, it'll always put in this amino acid, leucine, L-E-U. Now, you're not responsible for the three-letter abbreviations. You're not responsible for knowing these different amino acids. I will give you this table, and you'll just simply learn how to decipher like a highlights for kids pro, uh, problem. But every time the ribosome sees ACU, it always puts in threonine. Every time the ribosome sees CCC, it always puts in proline. And this is the code. This is the deciphering code to figure out how is it that the DNA can make mRNA and then the mRNA with the ribosome knows how to put in the correct amino acid. Three of these are what we call the stop codons, and they basically are like a period in a sentence. So if you think of a protein as being a sentence, right, something that starts and stops and makes sense as you read across, then the stop codons would be the period at the end. They, not, they tell the ribosome, hey, I'm done. Stop making the protein. This is the end of the message. This is the end of the protein. And when the ribosome sees a stop codon, it terminates. It stops the process. There's also a start codon, AUG. Right? And these are all in the chart, right? So there's AUG here. It says start. And then here are the three stop codons up here. So it's all in the table. Nothing you need to memorize. So let's take a look at how this works again. So here's that same picture I showed you before. We know that DNA is a linear molecule, right? It's a long, long chain of nucleotides. A small section of it is transcribed into mRNA. And with the help of the ribosome and the tRNA, every time the ribosome sees CGU, it'll always drop in arginine. Okay, every time it sees UCA, it'll drop in serine. How do I know that? because this table, sorry, tells me that. So if I look at this, it'll, it'll be exactly correct. Those letters will make sense when I look at this genetic table. Now, there's a couple things about this genetic code that I want to share with you. Uh, it is said to be non-redundant, but not, it is, sorry, it is, it is, let me take it back. The genetic code is redundant, but it is not ambiguous. So let's unpack this. The genetic code is redundant, but it's not ambiguous. What you'll see is when you, when you look at this table, for example, there are four different three-letter codes. All four of these can make the same amino acid. That's redundancy, right? If someone is redundant, what does it mean? They keep kind of saying the same thing over and over, right? There's, there's some repeat, re repetitiveness, if you will, in their speech or in their patterns. And so what we see is that all four of these, com actually all six of these combinations, right? All six of these make this same amino acid leucine. That's what's meant by redundancy, okay? There is some overlapping, if you will. But the genetic code is not ambiguous. What that means is that there's no doubt that every time the cell sees AAU, it'll always put in this amino acid. There's no ambiguity. There's no doubt about it. Every time it sees CGU, it'll always put in arginine. Every time it sees AGU, it'll put in serine. So there's no ambiguity, right? There's no ambiguous message here, but there is some, quote, redundancy 
in the, in the multiple options. And thirdly, the genetic code is nearly universal. And nearly, because this genetic code is the same if you're a bacterium, if you're a plant, if you're a fungus, or if you're an animal. Right? It's the same genetic code in all organisms on the planet. There are only a couple of variations that have been discovered. So I cannot say to you that the genetic code is universal. Not every single thing ever found on the earth uses the same code, but it's like 99.99 plus percent universal. Right? There, but there are a couple of, of exceptions. So let's make sure you're okay with this. If you were a ribosome and you were asked to look at this sequence, UUG, what amino acid would you direct to be added to the protein? So let's find it. UUG. Look around. Where do you, where do you find it? All right. Look on the chart. There's UUG. So you would know that this LEU amino acids, abbreviation for leucine, would be added in. How about this one? CGG. You find it in there? Arg. Right? Right? The pirate amino acid. Okay. So that's all there is to it. Okay? It's not that difficult. We just have to think about going to the chart, and I'll always give you the chart. There'll be a couple of problems on the test next week where I'll give you the sequence, and you just have to tell me what would those amino acids be. Now, because the genetic code is nearly universal, that means that we can do genetic manipulation. That means we can take a gene from one organism and put it into another organism, and it doesn't know the difference. So I can take the firefly gene that you know, lights up fireflies, and I can put it into a plant, and I can get a glowing plant. Because the plant doesn't know anything different. It's just, oh, this is now the, the luciferase gene, the gene that makes the, 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 the light. Or I can take that same gene from fireflies and put it into a cat and have a glowing kitty, okay? And these things exist. There are glowing kitties, glowing puppies, glowing monkeys, glowing pigs, all sorts of glowing critters. Hopefully no humans are be glowing anytime soon. They found that that hair gets in the way, so then they started making glowing nude kitties. You ever seen the nude kitties, the ones with the hairless cats? Oh, they're hideous. But at night, they, they, they would shine better, right? So now you can have a nice little night light that purrs, right? It's cute at night, yeah. right? They're kind of cute. But you go online, you see, you know, go look up glowing puppies, glowing kitties, glowing monkeys, whatever. We now have, you know, why did we do it? Because we can. There's really not much purpose in it. But it does drive home the idea that now we can take the gene for heat resistance in a tomato plant that we discovered and put that gene into corn, right? So now the corn is heat resistant. Or I can take a gene that helps uh, fruits ripen faster or slower or whatever it is I want to do, and I can now introduce that gene into another fruit, and now it will ripen faster or slower. These are genetically modified foods, right? So we, we're moving genes from one organism to another, taking advantage of this universal nature of the genetic code, and kind of monkeying around. And there's a lot of legislation I'm sure you're hearing about or a lot of controversy over these genetically modified foods and organisms in our diet, because right now there's no requirement to include that our cornflakes are made with genetically modified corn, right? And we don't really understand if there is any real risk or not, but that, that's gonna definitely be a big conversation in the near future. It makes good sense, though. If I can increase the load, if I can make a cow give more milk, or if I can make a, a a beef cow give more beef in a shorter amount of time if I can make sure that some crops are more heat resistant or pest resistant through genetic modification, then it makes sense, right, for us to move that way to feed the planet's population. But we still need to be careful, are these genetic modifications tested and proven not to be harmful to us? So there's one more little piece to this that I've got to tell you about, and as you're uh, writing out your sentences, I want you to be thinking about this as well. Uh, and that is the idea of reading frame. How does the ribosome know where to start? How do you know where to start reading a sentence? And I would say our eye is trained to look for a capital letter, 
right? So we look for a capital letter. That's where our eye starts reading the message, right, the sentence, and we stop at the period. So too, the ribosome needs to know where to start reading the message on the mRNA. So there's that start codon that says, hey, here I am. This is where the ribosome starts. And then there's this idea of reading frame, because I've told you that the ribosome reads in groups of three. Right? So every three consecutively is this, quote, reading frame. So if I, just to demonstrate this, if I wrote this sentence, um, the big red dog, whatever, right? So if think about this being a messenger RNA sequence. So there'd have to be a start, right? My eyes look at the capital T in the word the, and then the ribosome only looks at every three letters along the sentence. And then there was a stop codon that the ribosome said, okay, there's the period I'm done making the message. The idea of reading frame, though, is what if I have a point mutation? Right? What if I have a change in the DNA such that it should say the big red dog, but because of a point mutation or some sort of uh, change, let's say it's a, it's a deletion, I lose the letter, I lose this letter. Well, now what does the ribosome see? It sees the, and then the next three things it's going to see is this, and then it's going to see this, right? And then it's going to see this, and it's not even going to stop right. And basically, what have I just created? Junk, right? Garbage. Something that is not useful to me as a reader, something that's probably not at all useful to the cell. So this idea of reading frame gets us back to the idea of mutations. Now, what if I don't lose one letter, but I lose all three of these letters? Now my reading frame's been reestablished. Now I would see the red dog. Now, that sentence means something. I lost a little bit of information, right? I lost the fact that the dog was big, but I still know that it was a red dog. So the usefulness of it is less useful, but still somewhat useful. And that's what happens with proteins, too. If they lose part of the message, the protein might be partially good. It might do part of its job, but it can't tell us the whole story. It can't do its full function. I'll come back to those, tr those uh, mutations in a moment, and that really is our take-home lesson. I just want to make sure that we understand the role of those tRNAs. So again, if we've got our messenger RNA down here, single, and each of these little lunar landing molecules has on it an amino acid, so this one has Lu on it. This one had Phi on it. So this one's coming in, and the reason it's coming in is that these three anti-codon nucleotides are going to match up perfectly with these three codon nucleotides on the mRNA. So this sequence is telling the growing protein that leucine is going to be the next amino acid. We've got to have this system, right? So this is really the translator. The tRNA working with the ribosome, this is really where the, the business uh, occurs. So again, I want to make sure we understand these terms. These three letters, in this case, the GCU, that's the anticodon, a part of the tRNA. And the mRNA has these three letters called the codon. And you'll see how they match up, right? G down to C, C down to G, and U down to A. We always, though, when we look at that genetic code chart, we're always going to look at the three letters here. So we're only going to be reading the codon sequence on the mRNA, going to the table and figuring out now which amino acid is going to be added. The ribosome, you know, has this two part to it. So the mRNA actually goes right through the middle of these two parts. So imagine that the mRNA molecule kind of goes right between these two parts, the ribosome kind of shuts down on it and then slides along the mRNA. So again, you see this idea that these amino acids come in and each one is added in sequence to the growing protein. Now, back to the idea of point mutations. What did I say a point mutation was? When there's a problem in one of two things, a point mutation 
right, a small change in the DNA was the result of one of two things, either the replication machinery, right, the cell copied it and put the wrong letter in and didn't fix it, and now we're stuck with the wrong letter, right, a replication error, or point mutations could have been brought on by environmental issues like x-rays, UV radiation, carcinogens. But in something has changed, caused a mutation in the DNA. And again, we're not talking about the chromosomal uh, mutations that, that cause Down syndrome, but instead a single nucleotide along the DNA has been changed. Single nucleotide. Now, these types of mutations can include um, substitutions, right, where we're changing something, but it's also possible for these little mutations to be deletions or to be insertions. So sometimes you can add a letter in, sometimes you could lose a letter or two, sometimes you would substitute. I showed you a moment ago a deletion, didn't I? When I took the, the B out, the big, or made that junk, that would have been a deletion because I took it out, but I could have also stuck a letter in, or I could have changed it such that it didn't make sense or made uh, less sense. So let's take a look at this example. So on the top is my RNA. Again, what's missing in this whole sequence is that there'd be DNA up here that had been transcribed. Right here is the AUG. And if I look back on the genetic code table, I'm told that AUG is, quote, the start codon. That's sort of like the capital T or the capital letter in the first letter of the sentence. And AUG is always methionine, and you'll see that on the table. And then uh, this is a very short protein. It's just four amino acids long. And then it gets to the ribosome sees UAA. When you look on the table, that tells you that's a stop codon. That's like the period in the sentence. The ribosome stops. But what happens if we lose this U? Right? There's a point mutation, a deletion. The U is kicked out. So now what does the ribosome see? The ribosome still starts at the same place, but it goes, the next three letters are fine, but then rather than seeing U, 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 it now sees U, U, the third U is gone, so now it sees U, U, G, which codes for a different amino acid. The next three letters code for a different amino acid, and now because we screwed up the reading frame, the stop codon is not seen either, and the, the ribosome will just count, keep on reading down, and we're basically going to get a really crazy run-on sentence that makes no sense, some long thing that keeps on going. Or what if I added in a letter, right? I have an insertion, and if I were to add a U right here by chance, I would make my first amino acid, the, the ribosome would start here, but immediately that U would create a stop codon. So the ribosome would jump on, jump off. The protein would not be made. This protein is of no use to the cell. This protein was never even made. If the protein that we were supposed to be making is important for normal cell function, let's say this is a, uh, a really important protein in creating energy for the cell, then that mutation just killed that cell. Remember I told you mutations could either be fixed at the time they were done, Mutations could, be, could cause a cell to die, right? I said cellular suicide. This would be cellular suicide. If this mutation was an important protein and the cell could no longer survive without it, then basically the cell has committed suicide. I'm not trying to say that ch the cell chose to do it, but the cell dies as a result of the mutation. What if, like I said before too, Rather than just one letter being taken out, you take out a group of three. In this case, I take out an entire group. That would be like losing the word big in that sentence. I'm still making the protein. I'm still starting in the same place. I'm still stopping in the same place. But there's been one entire amino acid removed. Again, that protein may be somewhat functional or it may be completely a waste of time for the cell. It's hard to say. And there are other examples here. This is a substitution. So now, rather than losing or gaining, all I've done is switched out one letter for another. I switched the C, became a U. Hmm. But look at what the impact was. Met, met, lice, lice, fee, fee, gly, gly. 
Why are they both the same? I had a mutation, right? I had a change in the DNA. But what happened? It didn't make a change, did it, in the amino acids? What feature about the genetic code does this demonstrate? Redundancy, right? Because there's more than one way to say glycine, right? There's more than one way to get GLY as the amino acid. So that's the idea that the genetic code is redundant. Did a mutation occur? Sure, there was a change in the DNA. Did it make any difference in the end? Not a bit. So we would call this a silent mutation. That word's not on here. But that would be a silent mutation. A mutation certainly occurred, but it had no effect at all on the protein. A silent mutation, no change at all. But there was definitely a protein. Uh, sorry, there was definitely a mutation that occurred. And then here's another substitution. Here you see that the substitution makes a difference. So in this substitution, uh, the gly becomes a serine. Now the question is, is that going to make a big difference? Would making one letter change and changing the amino acid make a big difference? It could, or it may not make any difference at all. But here's the deal. There are a lot of diseases where it is only one letter difference. And let me just demonstrate one of those diseases for you here, and this is sickle cell anemia. There are other examples. Cystic fibrosis is a disease. The most common form of cystic fibrosis is a single letter change in a gene that causes a person to have a devastating disease like cystic fibrosis. This is going to be a one letter change that's going to cause a person to be normal or to have sickle cell anemia. So the protein that's defective in sickle cell anemia is hemoglobin. And you may know that hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen in your blood. Wild type is another way of saying normal, right? It's the regular normal hemoglobin. And in regular normal hemoglobin, the DNA in a little section of the DNA for that gene, the normal sequence is CTT. That normal hemoglobin would be transcribed and would give the mRNA GAA. We see that, right? If I look at my, on my chart now, GAA would always code for glue. That's normal. That's, what, that's the amino acid that should be in that place in normal hemoglobin. However, in sickle cell anemia, individuals have inherited or there was a new mutation that caused the DNA to be CAT rather than CTT. As we think about it, that would now be transcribed to create GUA. GUA, looking at the chart, would give us a different amino acid, valine. Now that valine is, I mean, it's just one change, right? We're going from glue to val. And you think, oh, just one amino acid. But that one little change makes a dramatic effect in the red blood cells. On the top are normal red blood cells. You've seen them in lab that biconcave shape, right? Normal red blood cells, they're seven and a half microns across. They have that biconcave shape, right? That's a normal red blood cell. But what happens is that hemoglobin, which is in huge numbers inside the red blood cell, when it has this mutation, the, the, the hemoglobin molecules make a long chain. And you already know that normal red blood cells are flexible, right? Normal red blood cells have to kind of twist and groove and slide through capillaries and blood, and blood vessels. So they're already kind of flexible. You saw how flexible they were in lab, too, because you know that they can crenate, they can shrink, or they can blow up and burst, lice. So you know they're flexible. Well, this long chain of hemoglobin now stretches out the cell and makes what's called the sickle shape. And this sickle shape is sharp and it's too big to go through normal blood vessels. And so these individuals get not blood clots like you and I get blood clots, but their blood gets blocked, right? The, there's a blockage of the blood flow. Now this happens randomly. It happens in high altitude. It happens under stress. So as long as these individuals kind of stay at ground, you know, ground sea level, and they don't have a lot of stress in their life, and they don't go flying in high altitude places, things like that, then they usually are reasonably okay. But there are triggers that cause this sickling event to occur if they have this gene defect. When this happens, if the flow of blood is stopped going to your little finger, eh, it might hurt, but you're gonna be okay. 
right? And they'll go to the hospital, they'll give them a transfusion, try to get rid of these red blood cells that are a problem, give them blood thinners, trying to get these uh, blood cells to move around more easily. But if that blood clot occurs going to the heart, to the brain, to the liver, to the kidney, then you could suffer very serious organ damage or even die as a result. So you've got painful episodes of blood not, being flow, not flowing properly mixed with the randomness of where or what tissue was affected by the defect. And so these individuals you know, usually have a shortened lifespan and one that the quality of life is certainly reduced because of uh, these attacks. So I just want to uh, demonstrate to you an example of, right, where a single mutation has a devastating effect. And there's dozens and dozens of these examples where human diseases are caused by a single letter. So that's the take-home lesson, right? Why do we care about the process of transcription and translation? Because we need to understand that changes in the DNA end up in the mRNA, and changes in the mRNA can then affect proteins. And without the right proteins, life can't go on normally. Okay, so that's really the big take-home lesson. And you need to know the players, right? Know what transcription and translation are. Know the players of each. Know where those processes occur in the cell. And be able to take a DNA sequence, transcribe it, and then translate it, having been given the table. All right, so I'll give you a short sequence of, of DNA. It'll have T's in it. I'll say now, what would the mRNA be? So look at all these examples, right? You see DNA going to become, look at these examples, like this one. Uh, no, not this one. The one that had the red on the top. Go to something like this. Where'd it go? Here it is, right? So this is what you need to be able to do. Take a sequence of DNA, just like this, right? You see the T's in it. From it, make the mRNA. Well, what do you do? Just look at the complementary letter, right? So the G becomes a C, the C becomes a G, the A becomes a U. That's what your mRNA sequence would be. Then once you have that mRNA sequence, now read it in groups of three to figure out, using the table, which amino acids would be added. Okay, so look at that slide as a, as a reminder of how to go from DNA to RNA to protein. And you would have the table to figure this out. Certainly not going to memorize that. What do you think? Are we okay with uh, this idea of mutations and why we care? Okay. Let's review really quick organelles. I know the answers are on your slide, so look at the screen, not on your paper. So I'll go through these one at a time. Number one. What is number one? Can you find it? Okay. Number one is the nucleus. What's its purpose? So, actually, number one is the nucleolus. I misspoke, right? The very center of the nucleus. And as I say each of these, I want you to also tell me what's its pur purpose. So the nucleolus is responsible for making ribosomes, right? This is where the ribosomes are put together, where the pieces and parts are put together for the ribosomes. Number two is the nucleus itself, right? That's where the DNA is found, the chromosomes are found, the command center of the cell. Number three is pointing to the little tiny dot. Number three is a ribosome, right? In the process of making proteins, as we know. Number four, who knows? It's a vesicle. It could be a lysosome. It could be a peroxisome. It could be something that's going to be released from the cell. I wouldn't ask you to recognize it because I don't know what it is, right? But they're all over the cell. Number five is pointing to the membrane itself. That is the endoplasmic reticulum, and that particular ER has ribosomes on it, so that's a rough ER. And what's happening there? Because there are ribosomes, that's also where proteins are being made. Number six, oops, I went ahead. The ribbon candy, that is the Golgi, right? What happens in the Golgi? That was the packaging center, the distribution center. So whatever's made by the rough ER and by the smooth ER is then sent to the Golgi to be packaged. Number seven, all the proteins within the cell would be collectively called the cytoskeleton, right? The skeleton of the cell. The microtubules, microfilaments, the intermediate filaments are making the cytoskeleton. Number eight, 
smooth they are. What's happening there? Not making proteins, there's no ribosomes, but instead we're making lipids, fatty acids are being made there. Number nine, the beans are mitochondria, and what's happening there? We're making ATP. Number 13, centriole, each one combination centrosome. What are they doing? What's, what's going out from the centrosome, centrioles? Mitotic spindles, right? So we saw how important those were during mitosis to grab the chromosomes and pull them back. Number 10, who knows, right? Another one of those vacuole vesicle things. Number 11, or sorry, number 12, again, I don't, don't try to call that a lysosome, right? It's just one of those little vesicle things and we would never be able to tell which one's which. Number 11, though, pointing to just the fluidy portion, right? Where all that section would be the, oops, would be the cytoplasm, right? And the liquid by itself within the cytoplasm is called the cytosol. So make sure, again, you can label and know those organelles and their purpose. And that finishes up the chapter three. We've been here for a while, right? We've been in chapter three for quite a while. The cells, the organelles, the transcription, the translation, the mutations, the cell cycle, the mitosis, all of that conversation is part of chapter three. What do you think? Any thoughts, concerns about chapter three? We're gonna do well in this, aren't we? We're gonna do really well. Okay, let's take a look at chapter four. And again, this is a chapter on histology, and that's something that you've all been introduced to in lab. So much of what I'm going to say to you right now should look quite familiar. Really should. Let me get out of here. So this is the next chapter, chapter four. Now, to appreciate histology, I want to go back a little bit in development and discuss, or at least think about, these, these, really, two question, these really two cool questions. How is it that a fertilized egg, right, egg and sperm come together, how in the world is it that that first cell, that zygote, is able to create you and me, right? All those cells, all the different complexity of you and me, how does that happen? And then how is it that as adults, we're then able to create gametes, right, that then can go on to recreate life. So it's a pretty cool story. So this is very, very general, but we see here the zygote. And the zygote is the fertilized egg, right? Egg and sperm come together at the moment of fertilization. About six days later, we're going to have a ball of cells called a blastula. You saw, that, you saw a fish blastula under the microscope when we were looking at cells undergoing mitosis. That ball of cells was a fish blastula sliced through about six days into fish embryo life. Now, after the, the blastula stage, and you see the blue and the yellow, after the blastula stage, you've got, it, you've got this ball of cells, and it starts to get a hollow center, and then in the next stage called gastrulation, the gastrula is formed. And it's almost like you took a balloon, right? You've got a balloon, you've got cells on the outside, you've got some cells on the inside. It's a multiple layered balloon. And it's like you take your fist and push it into the balloon. And now some of what was on the outside is drawn up into where you just shoved your fist into the balloon. So that's what happens with gastrulation or in the formation of the gastrula, there's actually an indentation area where cells from the outside start to go into the inside. And this is the beginning of the tissues and the cells making sense of what they will become. In that invagination, in that infolding of the blastula, three layers are identified. The outer layer, the blue layer, is called the ectoderm. And we saw in the vocab, ecto means outside, right? Outer. So the ectoderm is the outer layer. Then the salmon orangey colored layer is the middle layer. That's called the mesoderm. 
and then the inside layer is the endoderm. So it kind of makes sense, right? Ecto on the outside, meso, middle, and then endoderm on the inside. There is also some cells that will become your egg or sperm germ cells that are not really a big part of this conversation right now, but are also there. Now, let me go to a, a bigger slide of each of these. So the ectoderm, what's on the outside, will become your outer layers. It will become your epidermis. Kind of makes sense, right? The outer layer will become the epidermis of your skin. But maybe what's not intuitive is the outer layer also becomes your brain and your nervous system. Okay, so the epidermis and your nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord, that's going to be formed from the outer layer, the ectoderm. The inside layer, and this one makes sense, is going to form whatever it is that lines a tube. And so this is going to produce the um, epithelium that lines your gut tube, that lines your intestines. Remember in the intestines we saw the simple columnar, right? Or in the trachea we saw the pseudostratified columnar. Those tissues would be derived from the endoderm, whatever is lining the inside of your tubes. Okay. So this is going to become your, your digestive system, basically, and your respiratory system. Lastly is the mesoderm or the mesoderm, and this is the layer in between. And it's from the mesoderm that you're going to make all of your uh, muscle, right? So muscle is going to come from this, muscle, meso, and all of your connective tissues. So blood, bone, cartilage, fat, all the connective tissues that we learned about are also going to come from the mesoderm. Now, there's a lot more to this, but that's the general idea. So the outer layer, skin and nervous system. The inside, your inner gut structures like your uh, digestive system and your lungs. And then the mesoderm in the middle, all of your muscle and your connective tissues. So this is kind of showing that overall idea but it also goes into a new area of research called stem cells. So, you know, as voting adults, you'll soon be, I suspect, again, asked to vote on stem cell legislation. It seems to have, was a hot topic for a while. It's kind of cooled off a little bit, but there are still states that are voting on stem cell research and referendums on what can or cannot be allowed. So let's make sure you understand what stem cells do or can do and what they can't do and maybe what some of the hype is and where some of the pitfalls are. So, again, we see the egg and sperm coming together here. We're forming that fertilized egg. Another name for that is the zygote. And we're going to go through layers of development, so two cells, four cells, eight cells. We reach a cell called the morula. The morula is a solid ball of cells. Okay, so it's a solid ball of cells, and this is still very, very early, maybe 16, 32 cells, solid ball of cells. And then that solid ball of cells begins to hollow out. That's the blastula, right? I told you the blastula then kind of hollows out. And then, uh, okay, so, so the cells that are in this area, let me change colors, this white area right here, those cells are the cells that will become the entire individual. Right? So those cells are going to become everything that's in you and me, liver, kidney, cell, brain, you name it, every kind of organ, every cell in your body is going to come from that little group of cells. And that's, those are the cells that researchers are all salivating over for embryological stem research. Right? Those stem cell research, those are the cells they want. Now, the only way to get those cells is to, quote, destroy this embryo. Right? So that's where the controversy is, uh, in the destruction of that embryo to harvest those cells, to then put those cells into a Petri dish and grow them, right, in the lab. So we take the cells and we now grow them in the lab and we trick them, if you will, to become blood or brain or muscle or kidney, right? Because these cells have the ability to become anything. Now, why do you think it is 
that what you see here is liver cells, the neurons or nerve cells, heart muscle cells. You don't see here the formation of a heart. Why do you think we can't yet make organs? We can take these cells and we can create cells, right? We can trick them to make cells, but we can't yet trick them to make organs. Why, why do you think that is? What do you think is involved in the making of your liver, the making of your heart, the making of your stomach? What's missing in the Petri dish that's in you while you're being developed? Interactions, right? Your heart is created not in a vacuum, but is interacting with the tissues around it in a developmentally time-sensitive and chronologically, you know, chronologically and, and spatially sensitive way. So in order for your heart to grow normally, it has to be receiving signals from the neighboring cells during development. We can't just have a cell become a heart because it's lacking the signals from the overall body, from the nearby liver, the nearby lungs, and all the other nearby tissues. So the only way we'd ever be able to take a cell and make, a, make an organ is if we could figure out this incredibly complex array of time-sensitive and spatially sensitive signals that would be coming toward that, those cells to make the organ. So right now, all we can do is, is, in some cases, take these cells and make certain cells. Now the hope is that we can then take these cells and put them back into an individual for therapy. So a patient with diabetes, we could take cells, trick those cells into becoming pancreatic cells that would then be implanted into the patient and those cells would then start making insulin again for the diabetic. Or maybe a person who has a congenitive heart defect or who has a, had a heart attack, we could take cells and create some heart muscle cells and somehow inject those into the patient and get them to incorporate and repair the damaged heart. The problem is none of this has happened yet. It, there really isn't, there, there's a lot of research out there. And I think part of the reason we're not hearing much about embryological stem cells anymore is because the shift, the, the attention has shifted from embryological stem cells to adult stem cells. And adult stem cells are in you and me. So there is a subset of cells. Like I can go to my skin, and I could take some cells out of my skin. Now these cells don't identify themselves. I'm a stem cell, I'm not a stem cell. But we have adult stem cells in our body. So that when we cut ourselves, those stem cells can then revitalize our cells. There aren't any of those stem cells in our neurons. There aren't any of those stem cells in our muscle, in our heart muscle. And it used to be thought that once the embryological cells got their instructions and they became skin, right? That, that was it. Once a cell was skin, that was it. Or once a cell was muscle, that was it. Once a cell became kidney cell, that was it. Now we know that tumor cells kind of back up, don't they? They kind of de-differentiate to a more simplified state. But in normal development, we thought that when a, a skin cell becomes skin, that's it. About five or six years ago, scientists were able to take skin cells, add the right chemical signals to have them revert back to a simpler state and then fast forward them to muscle. So we've now been able to take some cells, skin cells, and trick them chemically to becoming muscle cells. Now that's cool. But it's coming from the patient, not from an embryo. Right, so we're now learning how to take adult stem cells, cord blood cells, uh, cells from the patient themselves, and actually use them for therapy. And I think that's where we're heading. And I think within 20 years, we'll no longer have this controversy over embryological stem cells because we won't depend upon them. We won't look to them for solutions. We'll instead take cells from the patient themselves. We'll take cells from the patient. So this patient has diabetes. Oops. This patient has diabetes, for example, and we're going to take cells out of him, put them in the dish, his skin cells, for example, trick them to become pancreatic cells, 
and then put his own cells back in. And that would bypass all the problems with transplantation, all the problems with rejection, and all of those things that are problematic when there's a liver or a kidney transplant. So that's where we're heading, and that's pretty exciting stuff. But right now, up till now, there has really not been any huge cure done with embryological stem cells. It's all been done with adult stem cells, right? So there's lots and lots of research going on where people have been given, uh, you know, a lot of even damaged hearts have been helped, not from embryological research, but from adult stem cells. Okay, so this brings me to a picture that kind of looks like a friend of mine. Kind of weird, right? Um, and as we talk about how DNA can move from one organism to a next, and we talk about how we're learning how to take cells, and maybe we'll figure out how to do this in a dog or another animal, and then bring it to human, and the question is, sometimes asked, how much human DNA would be required for human status? Now, I don't think we're going to be anywhere near this kind of conversation, and I think ethics will, will drive us away from this, but because of the universe, universality of the genetic code, you know, we have to think about these things a little bit. Okay, so that's just sort of a little aside about getting into this idea of tissues. And again, my chapter numbers are incorrect on this slide, but let's think about where we've been. Atoms make molecules, that was chapter one. Chapter two, we talked about chemistry, right? That was how molecules and macromolecules, lipids and fats and proteins, we talked about that. You've already been tested on that. Chapter three, we've been talking about organelles and cells, and continuing with that was the proteins and DNA story. That's still chapter three. And here we are today now in chapter four of the Martini book, talking about how cells make up tissues and this idea of histology. I'm going to go through this rather quickly because you already know much of this, and I'll slow down at those places where we need to spend some more time. Number one, you know that tissues are groups of cells. They work together. They have a common function, and there are four types of tissues. What you don't know is that epithelial tissue actually is derived from all three of those germ layers, right? So the epidermis, the epidermis came from the ectoderm. Your inside of your blood vessels came from your endoderm, and your serous membranes come from the mesoderm. Remember in histology, I said the mesothelium what were your serous membranes. So the mesothelium, the me those serous membranes are derived from your mesoderm. So your epithelial tissues in your body are derived from all three layers, whereas connective and muscle tissues are only derived from the mesoderm, and the nervous system is completely derived only from the ectoderm. So let's talk about epithelial tissue just like we did in lab. You know that they line the body surface, they line our cavities, they line the inside. Most of our glands are primarily epithelial as well, and the cells are so tightly packed that there's very, very little space in between them. These cells can be layered in a single layer, and we know that's simple, or in multiple layers called stratified. And again, they're so tightly packed that there's no extracellular matrix or very, very little space or stuff outside or around the cells. We also talked about how there are no blood vessels in epithelial tissues. Now, these cells are tightly bound to each other, and this idea of polarity once again comes up. Now, we talked about polarity before, like negative and positive charges on a molecule. Here, polarity is referring to the fact that cells have a north and a south pole. You know that epithelial tissues always are glued down to a basement membrane. So that means epithelial cells know their bottom side, right? And then they have a side that is free. So they know their top from their bottom. They have a, quote, a polarity. And uh, this polarity is going to be maintained by the cells attaching to each other in different ways. So what we have is the basal layer. The basal layer would always be the bottom layer. And as you know, that's sometimes attached to a basement membrane. The top layer, or the free layer, is called the apical surface. That's a new word. So the apical surface is the free or the top layer. The basal layer is the bottom layer. So this is very, really familiar to you, right? How would you describe the epithelium on the top? One layer thick, simple, and the cells seem to be rather flat, so that would be simple squamous, and those cells are sitting on the basement membrane, okay? 
whereas below, I would call this a stratified. The cells at the top are also flat, so this would be stratified squamous. Even further, because you know this, these cells at the surface appear to have nuclei. So I would even more completely call that stratified squamous non-keratinized. And you know that the cells come in three different varieties, squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. So again, the, the epithelial cells are glued down to the basement membrane. They lack blood vessels. Well, if they lack blood vessels, that means that epithelial tissues must get their nutrients from a neighboring area, right? There's no blood, there are no nutrients, there's no oxygen going directly to epithelial tissues, so they must obtain their nutrients and oxygen from a nearby energy source through the process of diffusion, right? So the nutrients are going to diffuse, the oxygen is going to diffuse, it's going to go from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and will get to the cells. There are, although there are no blood vessels in your epithelia, there are a lot of nerve endings. So there's a lot of, quote, innervation in your uh, epithelia. Um, you have all your touch receptors, all your nerve endings for touch and hot and cold and pain. All of those are certainly in um, your epithelial, or some of them in your epithelial tissues. Other of those nerve endings are deeper down in the dermis, in the second layer of skin. Some are, though, are up in the epithelia. Oops. And these cells are constantly being damaged, right? They're, they're on the outside. They're being exposed to things. So they're always being replaced. So they are highly mitotic, continuously dividing. And if you think about the skin, uh, the layers at the deep layers are always dividing and are moving up toward the surface. And the adult stem cells that I was referring to that are found in skin are down there in that bottom layer of your skin. What do these cells do or what do these tissues do for us? Well, we know that epithelial can be protective, right? If you think about stratified epithelium, very protective. Uh, there's also, though, the ability of things to move through epithelial layers. So when you think about uh, your gut and having simple columnar epithelium, right, molecules able to come in from your intestine into your body, that's a selectively permeable situation, isn't it? So not only are cell membrane selectively permeable, only allowing certain things in. Simple epithelia also, as an entire layer of cells, are also selectively permeable, making choices, if you will, what can and cannot enter into your body. Also, epithelial tissues are your glands, and glands are all about secretions. And so we're going to talk here in a moment about different glands and how they release their products. And what we're going to have are endocrine and exocrine glands. What do those two words mean to us? Endo, within, crin, to secrete. So endocrine glands are going to be releasing hormone molecules into the body, whereas exocrine glands would be secreting things that leave the body, like your tears, like your saliva, even your digestive juices, right? As your stomach releases gut uh, juices, it leaves the body through the digestive system. It doesn't enter into your body, but enters into your gut tube, which then leaves the body. So exocrine glands would be your tear glands, your salivary glands, your spit glands, and even your digestive organs. Again, lots of nerve endings. And if we look at this picture, we're reminded that the epithelial tissues are always sitting on the connective tissue. So the, here, the epithelial layer is just a single layer of cells. And this slide actually tells us that the basement membrane that we introduced in lab is actually a double layer. Okay, so the, the basement membrane is actually two layers. There's a layer that's made from the epithelial cells above, and there's a layer that's made from the connective tissues down below, and they fuse together to make the basement membrane. These two layers are the basal lamina and the reticular lamina. Now that word lamina, right, lamella, laminated, means layer. 
So the lamina is a layer. The epithelial cells are making the uh, basal layer, and the connective tissues are making the reticular layer. Okay, we see the terms here, basal, lamina, and reticular lamina. So the top layer is basal, the bottom layer of the basement membrane is the reticular lamina. And again, this, this creates collectively the basement membrane, and below that, then you find the connective tissue. So this would be the connective tissue down here below the epithelium, and notice that there are blood vessels in connective tissue, most of it. We already know this, right? We have stratified and um, simple, but keep in mind, this may help you think about skin a little bit. Remember, there's no blood vessels in the skin in this stratified epithelium. Let's pretend for a moment this is skin, right? Not, uh, pretend for a moment this is keratinized and these cells are dead at the surface. Down here in the connective tissue, this is where your blood supply is. So that means these cells must get their nutrients by diffusion up and through the basement membrane and provide nutrients and oxygen for all those layers. And you can appreciate now why skin starts to die. It's so far away from the nutrients that it starts to die as it moves toward the surface. How is it that these epithelial cells are tightly linked together? What is it that holds them together? Well, there are these things called tight junctions, which come in four types. To me, this cartoon reminds me of Charmin, right? It's, it's quilted northern or, you know, quilted toilet paper, right? So you've got these little quilted-like structures. Really what you have here in this cartoon are two cells, right? So here is an epithelial cell on this side, if you will, and here's an epithelial over here on this cell, on this side. And these epithelial cells are being tightly connected by these tight junctions. There's four types, tight junctions, are going to circle the epithelial cells up here toward the very, very top, toward the apical surface. So that quilting going around would be a tight junction. There are also adhering junctions. These are down here toward the basal end of the cell. And again, what both of these are doing is uh, all of these um, tight junctions, if this is one cell and another cell, these tight junctions do not allow molecules to just squeeze between the cells. What these tight and adhering junctions are doing is requiring that anything that's going to come into the body is going to have to go through the cell, right? Be selectively allowed into the cell and dealt with within the cell, and nothing can just squiggle between the cells, right? That would be uncontrolled. So these tight junctions and these adhering junctions create a barrier that create the selectivity of the cell membrane. There are also desmosomes. Desmosomes are more specialized. They're like uh, buttons or snaps. I think of them as like rivets on your genes. Where do you have rivets? Where do you have the reinforcement? The pockets, right? Places that get more stress. So desmosomes are like little rivets or snaps or buttons that hold the tissues together very tightly and they're always found at places of high stress. So there are a lot of desmosomes in your skin, right? As you slide across your car seat, your skin doesn't get sheared off, does it? So there's extra button-like structures holding your skin on to your body or the rest all over. There's also more desmosomes, for example, in the vagina, places of stress. Also gap junctions, last kind of uh, cell junction. These are like canals that are formed between the cells and allow for molecules to move laterally from one cell to the next cell. So small molecules like glucose and amino acids could move through or back and forth through these gap junctions. And then here is just the cumulative picture of all of these, okay? All of these are shown in one picture. So again, you have the tight junctions up toward the top, There we go. Tight junctions toward the top, adhering junctions toward the bottom, and then there are the desmosomes, these button-like, snap-like structures, and then the gap junctions. So I like this picture. It shows all of them in one place, and it also reminds you that the basement membrane is two layers, the basal lamina and the reticular lamina. Now, um, I didn't get quite as far as I wanted to today. I'm going to um, ask you to look through this uh, on your own and I will post a little note about 
how you can listen to me if you'd rather hear me say this information. What I really need to go through with you right now is just epithelial tissues and what they look like. You know what they look like. Connective tissues, you already know what bone and cartilage and muscle or fat looks like. At the end of that, then I would want to go in and tell you what muscle and nervous tissue looks like. There's not a lot, but it's going to take a few minutes. And then we'll spend some time on skin. So look for an announcement from me uh, tonight or tomorrow, uh, or today probably, that will tell you how to move ahead a little bit with success and look at some of this on your own. And that will allow me only to focus on the things that are new to you. Right? I'm not going to have time to repeat the things we've already seen in lab. So look ahead a little bit. I'll send you instructions. And then that'll give us uh, the highlights of histology and skin left on Tuesday.